Hey, everyone, welcome to the Cube Pod episode 60. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, our weekly podcast. We break down what's going on. Hey, Dave, uh, it's been a whirlwind. I'm flying to Boston, back to Vegas, cross country. Kids are graduating. I feel like I've been on a plane all month, but we still got conference season. Um, great to hey, see John. You. It was great seeing you at the airport in Las Vegas for <laughs> it's like handing off, minutes. Handing off Thanks for hanging out with me. You were getting off the plane. I was boarding the red eye. It was great to see you for yeah. a brief period. Yeah, it's like a handoff. You cover IBM. I'll take the ball over here at uh, Dell Tech World. It was, was fun. Great. Man, great so week. much going on. It was great. Look, the week is amazing. We had we were at the Cube. It was at IBM Think in Boston, Dell Technologies World in Vegas, Informatica World of Vegas, covering Microsoft Build with our editorial team. Next next couple of weeks, we got Snowflake, Click, AWS Financial Services in New York City, Cisco Live, Databricks, and HP Discover all coming up. And then we can maybe take a vacation in July for a day, and then get back to it. Um, so there's a ton of action and, and Dave, to me, it's AI shockwaves are hitting right now. And this is what the theme of the podcast will be. I think today will be the shockwaves of AI hitting. And I, what I mean by that is that you starting to see, as we've been saying on the cube, the lines are forming with the old way and new way are kicking. You're starting to see the formation. Things are lining up. You start to see the infrastructure surging with the spending. You're starting to see that lift coming in the middleware, the data wars are coming with the cloud wars. You can see that emerge. And then it's like on the top of the stack, you got uh, co-pilot madness and complete developer intoxication around open source coding and and just overall AI apps. So you have like this perfect storm continuing to surge and the shockwaves are starting to hit. Value creation, I mean, you're starting to see new ventures, company valuations are up, people are making a lot of money. The value, the wealth creation is kicking in. And then, you know, again, the developers and these around these new experiences. So all that is pumping. Nothing more compelling than NVIDIA's 10 to 1 stock split, which hit right after their earnings, which was smashing um, this week. Just incredible stock surge. Hyperscale to the big buyers. The GPUs are coming into the data center. AI PCs are, are, are hyped up. Uh, a lot of GPUs in that conversation. Infra again, infrastructure spending. And everyone's got co-pilots. It's co-pilot madness, Dave. NVIDIA just continuing to pop. Yeah. And, and I think this is a bellwether for um, what we've been reporting and you've been doing a lot of research on is that in the infrastructure from the silicon into the hardware as the new clustered systems come in, that market's developing super fast. And it's going to change the game. I mean, Intel, ARM, all these old school chip guys um, and going to maybe wake, make way for what Qualcomm arm and all the, the and NVIDIA Dave, Dave, this is comp completely amazing. What's the disruption yeah. going on? The disruptive enablement. Well, again, wealth creation, more value creation happening. It's just incredible. Well, I mean, NVIDIA's quarter was just uh, uh, amazing. I mean, I said they had to beat by billion and a half revenue in order for stock not to go down. They beat by basically a billion and a half, which is insane. I mean, they, they, their sequential revenue, they did 26 billion this quarter. And that sequentially, John, they grew 18%. A lot of companies would be thrilled with 18% year on year. Their, their year on year growth was like 262%. I mean, amazing. Uh, their, John, gr their gross <laughs> margins were 77% this quarter. Okay, that's pretty good. The operating margins were 65%. It's like the, the most profitable of profits ever. And like you said, 10 to 1 stock split. 600% profit, roughly, increase. 10 to, to 1 year. stock split. So that's going to make the stock soar for no reason other than people are don't understand math. Uh, um, and But there were some really interesting uh, tidbits on the call, on the earnings call. Very last question that Jensen got, he said, well, they were asking him like, how, how can you like, continue this innovation? He said, well, I can announce that there's something coming, new chip beyond Blackwell. No surprise there, right? Mm -hmm. But he said, we are on a one year, he used the term rhythm. So they've got a one year cadence of announcements. And he said, we're doubling down on ethernet. We're doubling down on networking with NV link. They got ethernet. They have InfiniBand and this one year cadence beyond Blackwell. They got new NICs coming, new network coming, all the Ethernet action. So it is the AI shockwave. And, and John, th that one year cadence is just amazing. So everybody was concerned that people were going to 
hit the pause button because there was an article in the Financial Times that said AWS was waiting for Blackwell. Well, he said, look, there's just so much demand for 200s for Blackwell. Demand is way outstripping supply. So that says to me that Blackwell is like closer than people think. Yeah. And guys like AWS are going to get their hands on them sooner rather than later. And then the last thing I'll share with you, one of the most interesting things that Jensen said, my mind, was he said, look, you want to be first in this game. He's so good at positioning. Yeah. You want to be first. Here's why. When you're first, you make a radical improvement over everything else that you've ever seen. It's like ChatGPT and then ChatGPT4. We'll see with ChatGPT5. He goes, when you're first, it's like this amazing step function. He goes, when you're second, it's like 0.3% better. So do you want to have an amazing step function or do you want to be 0.3% better? And that was really, I thought, both profound and just brilliant marketing. Well, yeah, first of all, he's he's so smart. They're smart because NVIDIA's moat is massive, right? You look at the Intel's Moore's Law, for instance, how that's kind of petered out a little bit compared to what's going on in the in this market that you just analyzed with NVIDIA. There's a new era uh, here, right? We've been talking about this Gen AI shift. It's a true platform shift. It's a disruptive enabler, meaning it enables new things. The net new category, as Jensen puts it, generative AI, it generates things. It's disruptive enable. So it's enabling value, but it's disrupting something, meaning and something's got to go. So in, in these major inflection points, disruption happens and enablement. It's very rare that that happens. Normally, enablement's like, hey, I got a platform and enable some value, and you pay that value, whether it's a tool or a platform. Here, we have disruption and enablement. That's what these, these key technologies are doing. And what NVIDIA is doing with the parallel matrix computing model is they're just basically creating a massive increase in speed, step function, but also to your cadence point, with custom silicon, as we've been reporting at the financial analyst meeting at Broadcom, and Qualcomm's in the same boat here with Snapdragon, is that you're seeing custom silicon and packaging innovation happen very, very quickly. You had um, Jazz Tremblay on the cube. He was showing some props. Again, packaging, how they can consolidate down the connectors and the components into smaller, uh, less parts. That's more efficiency. And again, talk about Ethernet. Ethernet's going to be built into the fabric of the motherboard. So the AI PC has got a lot of hype on it, Dave. And so this whole direction is about full platform end-to-end -end support. Data center is now the AI factory. Um, and you got all these other things that, that NVIDIA is doing. And they're doing it, I don't want to say closed system, but it's definitely not open source. And, and this is where the debate's going to be continuing to happen. Does NVIDIA's closed source model Okay, when I say closed source, I mean closed source to them. Com compete against the cheerleading of all this other stuff, the open stuff that I think a bunch of vendors are involved in to try to replicate CUDA. I think NVIDIA will win big, just like we had the argument about, not the argument, but the debate about open AI when NVIDIA came out. First winner at scale wins. And, and open AI is winning because of that. NVIDIA's in the same boat, Dave. Because they're closed source player, the value is accrued by scale. Okay, so you have the value capture built around scale laws, scaling laws, AI scale laws, which are in play here, or is it's going to happen? So if centralized forces hold, okay, scale advantages compound, leaving open this this uh, this, this open frag, uh, fragmented sources alternatives behind. So scale first, close source. <laughs> Nvidia can oh. do it; they could continue to surge. I mean, I think it's going to be incredible. So I, I'm bullish on NVIDIA. Um, I think they got some land grab going on for sure with NIMS. NVLink certainly solid, but the whole NIM thing, I'm, I'm kind of not sure about that. I think that's going to be upside for them, but they don't even have to capture that. They still win with the other package. So I think you nailed it. Um, and I want to just unpack something for our listeners. So you were talking about uh, the increase in performance for parallel you know, sort of matrix computing, what, what Jensen calls accelerated computing. So the prevailing, we all know the prevailing performance metric, you know, in, in, during the Moore's law era was, was Moore's law determined that performance metric. Now you remember it used to be clock speed, but then after that sort of, you know, the curves flattened, it became cores, but it was really, that was the prevailing performance metric. And 
in in 10 years, that metric increased 100x. So that's two orders of magnitude in, t in 10 years is amazing, right? But when you compare that now to the prevailing performance metric in this era of parallel computing or accelerated computing, in eight years, the 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 teraflops of NVIDIA's output of their products has increased a thousand X, a thousand X in eight years versus a hundred X in 10 years. And again, that is to now is the, it's really a measure of throughput, but that's the prevailing performance metric today. So we are entering a new era in computing and it's to accommodate all these large language models and these AI breakthroughs. And the other tidbit that came up on the call with Jensen is he said, look, InfiniBand started out as a computing fabric and we turned it in to a networking fabric. Ethernet is a networking fabric and we're going to drive it into a computing fabric. Now, of course, as you know, you know, Broadcom is doing similar things. Those are the two leaders in this networking game. And so he he's saying he's all in on Ethernet. He has to be because Ethernet is open. And um, and I, I tell you the other thing is what the other tidbit that was surprising to me in the call, he said the number one vertical for NVIDIA this year is going to be automotive. I was like, what? So that's full self-driving with Tesla and their big clusters, and it's got to be BYD as well. So can you believe that? Number one, automotive, ahead of financial services, for example, ahead of healthcare and big pharma. So I think to answer your question, he's got NVLink for the data center that's all in on all NVIDIA, the homogeneous one that wants the absolute highest performance. And he's got Ethernet for those situations where it's an all Ethernet data center. He's got air cooled. He's got liquid cooled. He's going to figure out how to scale liquid cooled. And a year from now, a year from Blackwell, he's got basically the next generation of all this stuff coming out. So I agree with you. Their moat is deep and wide. The thing about the automotive is interesting because if you look at the chip players, okay, I know, I know we got, you got some big research about the drop on this. So it's actually timely. We, we get into it. I want to ask you this. If you look at, remember when Jensen was on stage and we then had one on, um, went to the analyst meeting with uh, Broadcom, Charlie Kowaz's team, he was up on stage. They really kind of, I mean, they weren't, ex they, they were explicit about it, but they didn't really amplify it. But they were clear. The consumer AI is where the chip game is. So if you look at NVIDIA, the automotive makes a lot of sense. It's essentially a data center in the car, right? If you look at the AI PC direction, that's AI devices. So the the notion of a device, I call PC. I mean, AI PC is basically like an edge device as far as I'm concerned. So it's a network network computer or network device. The action around uh, NVIDIA and GTC was the combination of all these GPUs together create these clustered power, high-performance computing machines, essentially supercomputers. So if you think about wh what needs a supercomputer more than anything, it is a car because there's a lot of stuff going on in, say, a Tesla or a car. Same with healthcare. I think healthcare is a, um, an underreported market. And I think NVIDIA doesn't have a good wheelhouse there, but companies like Dell, IBM, HPE, Oracle, they're all in healthcare. So I think you'll see the AI factory model go to healthcare. And then in the car, you'll see specialized models from, um, from NVIDIA and, and others because they have to drive the, the power, right? They got to get in there because you're going to need low latency power. And again, the workload is the driver in the car. And that's where NVLink and NVSwitch will work. So to me, that makes a lot of sense. Plus, they, they're a big buyer of chips. So if you're NVIDIA, we had this big debate, remember? Are they a chip company or are they a software company? Well, guess what? They're selling GPUs in the, end of the day and they have licenses behind it for the software. I get it. But who buys chips? Car people. They're, well, a, they're, they're a customer. So you talk about a hyperscaler with AWS and Azure and Google. Those are the big cloud players. But the big automotive players are buying bulk too. So they're going to be GPU buyers, but smaller, faster, cheaper. If the NVIDIA moat continues and the Blackwell becomes small, smaller, faster, cheaper, okay, because that's the way the physics is going and the materials management, cars will have power in it, the power of a data center. Makes sense. Makes total well, sense.
I mean, but it's I, a car. It's a car factory, basically. But I think Nvidia is just to to push back a little bit. I think Nvidia is more than a chip company. I think they're a platform company. And you know, Jensen makes this point a lot. He made it in our little private analyst meeting that we're a systems company. We build entire systems. And so we know where the bottlenecks are. We know yeah. where we need to optimize them. We disaggregate them and sell them so that when people build their AI factories, you know, we can help them tune them. Yeah. And they've got hardware. They've got so Crawford Del Pratt brought this point up in my little Twitter poll where he said the best example of NVIDIA is the monopoly is they got a duopoly like Wintel. The difference is it's all in one company. Can you imagine if they were able to acquire ARM? You know, maybe Lena Khan was right. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> Hold on, mark the tape on that one. Let's get to this. <laughs> How far in are we on this podcast? I want to make sure I grab that soundbite. Just You're like, in. Just like the soundbite I heard when I was listening to your Dell presentation, I heard you say on the cube, I'm afraid of AI. You well, did, you did say that. Uh, I will say I, 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 I yelled at the I scream at the airport. Dave's not afraid of AI. Well, you I said the, you know, I said at the same time I'm 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 really excited about AI, but at the same time I'm afraid of the unintended consequences. I am. <laughs> I was yelling, and people are looking at me at the airport. Why is he Why is he yelling at the screen? <laughs> 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 anyway, so getting back to the chips, Dave, I want to ask one more question before we move on to the next topic because I think this is pretty interesting. Nvidia, we just going gaga over because it's just I mean, just they are the they are big, they're massive. They're, the gravity they throw around the market is pretty strong. Uh, TSMC, you mentioned ARM, right? TSMC is another one. Broadcom, Qualcomm, Intel, uh, AMD, Samsung. And you got the other players, Micron, um, SK, uh, uh, SK Live Materials, yep. and all, all these other companies. So let's talk about let's talk about the big ones. TSMC, Qualcomm, uh, Broadcom, and Intel, AMD. Let's, what, what, where do they, what are they, what, where is this going down? Is is this a disruptive enablement market where you're starting to see the NVIDIA's and TSMC and ARMs replace the old guard ARM and Intel? Because um, the x86 architecture is different than what NVIDIA is doing. Everything about AI around neural networks, um, around how GPUs are now becoming or XPUs are becoming a key part of the architecture as these new system design computing architectures are emerging. Not so much compatible with the x86, is it? What, what's your read on this? What's your analysis? Well, so the, we we just quantified, Floyer and I, the, the global semiconductor ecosystem. And now we took the little liberties with that because we're including all of NVIDIA in there. So it's not just it's not just the the fabs. It's not just the people like ASML who supply the fabs and, and, and aim at. It's not just the software companies like Cadence, although they're relatively small. Um, and ARM and, and, and the chip designers, we also took, you know, a little few liberties and included the entire NVIDIA, you know, estate and portfolio. But that, if you, if you look at it that way, the global ecosystem that we just described is, is going to be almost a trillion, 900 billion by 2028. And that's a 10% CAGR from 23 to 28. And four companies comprise all about 45% of the total, NVIDIA, TSM, Broadcom, and Qualcomm. And then in, then it falls to Intel. But in, Intel, so what we, we did is we we tried to forecast, we used a bunch of assumptions. I won't go into the methodology in depth here. You can read the breaking analysis if you want to understand the full methodology. Um, but we have NVIDIA actually accelerating its CAGR from 23% to 25% over the next five years, including 2023. We have NVIDIA at $168 billion company by 2028 we got tsm almost doubling from 70 to 135 billion we got broadcom going from 36 to 58 billion and we got we got qualcomm going from 36 billion to 55 billion we have intel essentially flat okay yeah. and so I mean, and, and our assumption is that the decline in x86 is not going to be offset by foundry and foundry revenue we we have at 22 billion others have it higher i'm sure intel has it higher but here's the assumption our assumption is that their 14a process is going to be 12 to 18 months late now 14a is where remember we talked about this last week mm -hmm. they're they're doing gate all around and backside power and na euv technology with that funky organic polymer that we sort of described last week three innovations in one process and so our expectation is that that's going to get delayed by 12 to 18 months. And as a result, 
that's going to push them push them into the flat zone in that period. Now, if we're wrong and they actually mir- pull off a miracle, which it would be a miracle if Pat pulls this off, and they're actually able to ship that in 2027, then I think in that case, it sets them up to overtake Samsung because Samsung has very similar challenges to Intel in that it's struggling to get high enough yields out of its factories. Meanwhile, TSM is our assumption is the big winner here. You saw that Apple's trying to uh, close uh, to lock up all the two nanometer production. Yep. Did you see that this week? I did. And, 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 and so, and TSM is like the only company out there that can do it. And so TSM is passing on H a E U V because they don't, they think it's too expensive. They don't think the economics play. So Pat Gelsinger is throwing an amazing hail Mary and he's got to have Aaron Rodgers like luck to pull this thing off with a lot of skill behind him. So, but that's kind of how we see it, John. Yeah. And I think AIPCs, we, we believe, are going to go mainstream and ARM designs are going to dominate. And we can talk about that if you like. Yeah, first of all, so first of all, yeah, great analysis. And when when are we going to expect to see this uh, work hit the market from Cube Research? Yeah, I'll drop it tomorrow. All right. So breaking analysis tomorrow, check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, on the on the uh, ARM, on the AIPCs, my big question coming out of Dell Tech World um, was, where's the meat on the bone? A lot of, a lot of cheerleading, a lot of hype around this um can you be more specific around the aipc uh, specifically what is it and why is it going to get mainstream what's the driver behind it um, and what's some of the workloads you're seeing so i think it's worthwhile looking at the history the recent history of pcs the pc volumes peaked in 2011 they popped back up during covid but the the real breakthrough the the first signal was in 2017 with the first true inference iPhone. I think it was, I can't remember, John. It was either the iPhone 8 or the iPhone 10. They kind of came out, out around a, the same it time. It was the face recognition for the face. Yes, it was password. a face recognition, exactly, using the NPUs, the neural processing unit. That was 2017. And then Apple shipped the first NPUs in laptops, um, which is the first example of AI PCs in 2020. And then, of course, COVID pushed up the laptop demand. And then after COVID, you know, laptop demand, PC demand started to decline. What Microsoft announced this week at Build was essentially completely rethinking the Windows 11, the Windows stack, turning it into AI, making it essentially an intelligent co-pilot engine. So now you're going to be interfacing with your computer with natural language. Um, you're going to be talking to it uh, in, in ways, you're going to be telling it what to do as opposed to trying to look it up as, you know, how to do stuff. And you're going to see new applications developed. You're going to see a smaller form factor. So these PCs are going to go on in in, in Ozempic. And you're going to have a 24-hour battery life. So you're going to have a a, a a 4X or or more increase in battery life. So they're going to get smarter, smaller, faster, more specialized. They're going to be able to understand your language. And they're going to last for 24 hours. You you pull an all-nighter, you'll still have power without unplugging in. I think I think that is going that is going to be um, a real tell sign that supports your Intel's flat um, share our um, thesis. I mean, if you look at what Microsoft's doing, the Wintel relationship was killer. Windows was based on Intel. Okay, so if you look at the Surface uh, laptop, go way back to the original ARM, which was on Windows. There, they're now if they do this. Okay, on ARM, there's a huge threat to Pat Gelsinger's legacy at this point. He throwing the Hail Mary, okay, and now you got Snapdragon growth coming in, okay? Okay, remember that when in 2016, Qualcomm was first to run on, on, on those on those machines. Um, but ARM's got a huge advantage. Oh, yeah. So oh, this God. is going to be, the, this this is going to be, this win the Wintel was a huge relationship for Intel. The x86 um, had inflated margins, sales volumes are going to be gone. That's going to be a blow to Gelsinger, Dave. Okay, let me ask I you mean, a question. The volume, yeah. the volume asks you always talk about volume, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and they got to have the fabs going to have volume. Let me, okay, let me ask you a question. Yeah, let me ask you a question. What percent of Apple laptops? had ARM processors in 2010? Um, don't know. 
Zero. Okay. <laughs> okay. <You're in. laughs> what percent of Apple laptops have ARM processors today? Don't know. Hundred percent. They have no okay. Intel. No. So the the uh, maybe there's some remnants there, but essentially gone. So my point is now I don't think it's going to happen that fast with AI PCs, but but what Microsoft announced this week at Build, they, I'll put it into my words. Hey, we saw what Apple did. They got it right. They designed their own chips. They are 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 retrofitting their their PCs or or reimagining their their PCs and their laptops, and and we're going to do the same thing. So Intel, thanks. You, we 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 loved you. We had a great relationship, but we're going. We're moving on. We're doing exactly what Apple did. So you you better get your yeah. you know what together, and let us know when you when you're ready. But right for now, we're going in a different direction. And so, to us, that means it's not going to follow the same path as Apple because that was dramatic and it was all within one company. But we have ARM based AI PCs you know, overtaking the uh, uh, x86 based PCs sometime, you know, in the latter part of this decade, call it 27. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. by 2030, you're still going to have x86, you know, PCs because there'll be, you know, leftover inventory and, and yeah. look at Intel is going to try to hang on as long as they can, but it, it is essentially a managed In, Intel, business. Intel, Intel has to join the army ecosystem it's interesting you need some you always talk about history trivia you know um the wintel when they decided to move off the x86 architecture microsoft you know galsinger and intel now have to make it up on volume because there's, there's not there's no monopoly anymore what's interesting about intel is paul odellini was the ceo back when steve jobs brought the iphone smartphone to them turns out intel didn't even bid on the business I know. Okay. And and um Intel felt that Jobs' bid was too low. And Odellini, by his own admission, couldn't see the volume. He was wrong by the order of magnitudes, obviously. He said could there was imagine, no business case. He said there was no you, business case. Could you imagine that blunder? Paul Odellini says, Steve, ah, it's too low. It's never gonna you know, make up in volume. What? So to your point, you've always said here, even in the pod and in your breaking analysis. Fab's got to make it up on volume, right? And if they want to be competitive with TSMC and others, they got to make price concessions to win accounts from exist away from existing players. They don't have the but, leverage. But that's okay. the point at which Intel evidently lost its paranoia, right? They just became, it was hubris. And so had Intel brought in Pat Gelsinger in 2011, I think, you know, maybe Pat would have, would have done it. Let's, let's assume he would have. Maybe assume he had this vision. I if think Pat Kelsinger, if Pat Kelsinger got the CEO job rather than leaving, go to work for EMC. Remember, he left. He should have gotten the job then. Had he, I think he would have. He would have made that deal happen. I, I think so, John. I think Pat would have would have stayed paranoid. And can you imagine if he, you know, they were the first ones to do, um, yeah. you know, FinFET back in 2011. Had Pat Gelsinger stayed been been at the helm, I think they would have stayed paranoid. I mean that. They they introduced that innovation at the early part of the 2010s, and then TSMC said, "Wow, that's a great idea," and they did all the innovation around in Fed. And so, it, it, Pat's doing everything possible. He's raising money. He's he's raising awareness. He's getting money from the government. He's getting loans. Yeah. He's putting building fabs, and but you know, right, four, so, five so nodes in four years. But get, get, let's get back to the AI PCs and then we'll move on to the build and yeah, the yeah. data, some of the data stories. So your point, okay. In 2017, the, uh, the face recognition, of the iPhone started seven years ago. You're starting to see right. that. And Apple really pioneered that. Now, now you're saying, you just said, okay, um, that the MacBooks and all the PCs are going to have arm in it. You know, first the tablets got it. So you had, you know, the tablets got it first. And then you got now the PCs. All right, but it's ARM, not just ARM. It's also AI systems. It's got NVIDIA in there. It's got a bunch of new Broadcom stuff. It's got Ethernet. So the, basically any kind of device, PC, tablet, whatever, phone, is ARM-based. That's what's happening. That puts a win in TSMC. Qualcomm wins big. Um, AMD and Intel, maybe not so much, Dave. They're the Think ones about that... That will fall back on this one. So think, think about the dynamic shift. So it used to be that Intel would set the direction and then everybody else would follow. 
And the exact opposite is happening today. Now, as it pertains to AMD, that's like this AMD is really interesting. I'll, I'll share what we have for AMD. We got AMD growing from 23 billion to 37 billion because they're not shackled by fabs. Remember, uh, Jerry Sanders, who was the CEO of, in, of, of AMD, said, real men build fabs. Well, that didn't really work <laughs> out so well. So they needed a real woman. Lisa Sue to come in and, yeah. and, and get them on the right direction, but it took a while, but yeah. so, so AMD got us act together, designing chips and has been really eating Intel's launch in the X86 market. And we're assuming that is going to continue mm -hmm. that, that, that in, while the, the X86 market will decline, AMD will continue to, to gain yeah. share, but at 45% of AMD's business, our assumption is by 2028 will still be x86 okay. but that means more than half will be non x86 so they've got that benefit so as long as okay. they can keep gaining share from intel um but they've got okay. that headwind of a declining market and so obviously i think amd relatively speaking is in in, in better shape because they don't yeah. have to build fabs and they're gaining share uh and they've got alternatives to you know gpus and they're ahead in that game so but yeah, that's the sort of situation with AMD in my my view. Well, that's like I was saying at the beginning of the podcast. You start to see the old way and new way. And remember the PC software vendors back on the old Wintel days would introduce software. Windows would always be, we always called Windows bloated, big, heavy, fat Windows. Because they would always push the envelope on the GUIs, the GUIs, user interface, which is great. As the graphics got better, there was a need for more processors. The 286, the 386, the 486, the Pentium, multi-core, the, the, the rest goes on and on. So that power dynamic in the PC business, the old PC business, Dave, was better software to, tr to, to devour that new software that needed more energy. So if you were running an old PC and you were trying to run the latest version of Windows, guess what? It was slow as hell. So you had to get the new version. That made the upgrade cycles work great. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's put a pin in the upgrade cycles or refresh. Today, the it's not a Wintel architecture. It's a Win Arm. Okay, Win Arm, TSMC, NVIDIA Arm. I call them in the same case, which is called the Win Arm. That's the new power dynamic. Look at what's happening. Windows 11, Windows 12, tons of co-pilots, facial recognition. Generative AI, co-pilots, automatic video creation, photography, video enhancement, audio, podcasting, virtual reality, augmented reality. All this generative AI is new, embryonic, early innings, early days of this next PC software wave. And it's going to devour resource, compute, and combination of systems. We are now on a completely new trajectory cycle of PC. Okay, this is just like the Wintel, but it's not Wintel. It's not Intel. It's ARM. It's it's going to be WinARM. I think you coined, coined that term out there. So I uh, put that term out there. But this is what we're seeing in the marketplace. Look at all the hot apps and AI that everyone's talking about. Type in a keyword and a video comes out. Video this, AI this. All the generative stuff is going to require massive data. It's going to, you know, we heard Michael Dell say, what did he say on stage? GPUs devour storage. Well, guess what? More infrastructure. This is now the new era, Dave. A new cycle is here. The shockwaves are being felt. Look at Dell Tech World, the AI factory, the AI PC. Look at IBM, tons of Watson X. Infrastructure, middleware, apps, whole new ballgame. This new wave is here. Starting to see everything. Starting to see the new. Old way, new way. And you don't want to be on the old side. If you're if you're if you're in this market, it's a whole nother industry cycle kicking in. New VCs are going to come in, new ways to invest. You already got VCs slapping against each other. You get Andreessen Horowitz and Founders Fund going at it right now. Yeah, you know, between open source software versus <laughs> uh, you know, uh, closed source software. Okay. Uh, it's, um, it's incredible. Again, in, money in, making, wealth creation, developer frenzy. It's it's the shockwaves are everywhere. And you think about the progression. You, you keep talking about volume, and you're absolutely right. So it starts with consumer it starts with smartphones started with apple it's it's gone it trickle started to trickle into to pcs now it's gonna a big wave into pcs and guess what it's coming to the enterprise it's what exactly <laughs> what we predicted four years ago that arm was going to be the dominant architecture of in the enterprise in the second half of the the 2020s and it's exactly how it's playing out John. Now, I, I think I think Intel missed out on the fact that 
they underestimated the um, the smartphone and the tablet market mainly because they felt that the, the volumes were going to be lower quantities and not higher prices and passed on it and said fuck it we're not going to do it i think they yeah. said and and by the way huge mistake because the tablets were bringing in the new era for the pcs and then smartphones we all know what the numbers are there yeah well so again we didn't predict gen ai but we did predict that ai would be the driver we said two things it would be ai it's gonna be offloads in other words there was so much wasted cycles taking traditional x86 general purpose computers doing storage doing networking running all this all the activity in the io through the the memory um of the of, in this in the cpu doing all the work yeah. that was going to get distributed by the way charlie kawas made that call years ago it's going to go shift from a CPU centric to a connect centric environment that is playing out. Yeah. And that's the other thing, you know, the, the beauty of Broadcom is we've talked about this. They don't compete head on with NVIDIA and GPUs. NVIDIA is their, their fastest growing customer. So they, they get to play in all of these markets by providing the really difficult to do sort of interconnect technologies and networking technologies, you know, and by the way, they have like three major custom Silicon deals. One with Google, we know that, 10-year deal. One with, we think, Meta, like a four-year relationship. And we believe the third one is ByteDance. And they're essentially building custom silicon for these hyperscalers. So that in that sense, they do compete indirectly. So they can, but but these are really durable, long-term relationships. So that's why, you know, Broadcom is essentially, you know, Broadcom, TSM, and uh, NVIDIA, kind of the top three AI plays right yeah, now and then add the mix the, the mix Qualcomm with AI PCs they yeah. dominate in 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 mobile and they're going to dominate in AI PCs by the way Broadcom wins huge with the AI PCs as well not just Nvidia and, yep. and ARM Broadcom yep. has Good got point. all the little ethernet PCI parts on there so Broadcom will win too again you could call it win arm or win win the win teller is replaced by win arm win Broadcom win <laughs> Nvidia so but I, I like win arms a better acronym because I think that speaks to this next generation Dave and again the 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 dominating of the future will be this new this new wave and remember the winners will be Qualcomm Broadcom TSMC and NVIDIA clearly out of the gate. Um, the PC makers like HP, the old HP, now HP.com, um, they got PCs. They're going to have to flex. Dell's clearly on the bandwagon big time. They, you know, we heard them. We heard from Michael Dell. We interviewed all their top people this week. Um, they are on, on this. So there's no doubt in my mind that Michael Dell gets it, right? So it's clear there. It's clear to me that IBM gets what's going on. Now, they don't have a PC, but they certainly are looking at the enterprise saying, we are going to drive multi-cloud, open shift, Red Hat, and our IBM Watson program as the AI product everywhere and integrate all of our old portfolio under the covers behind Watson X. So, yeah, so, so you were at the IBM. World, all these little software packages that they got, not little, they're big, will be under the flagship leadership of Watson X. That's what's yeah. happening with IBM. Watson X... Watson X data, Watson X government, Watts, uh, uh, governance, Watson X AI. They're basically IBM strategies to drive Watson everywhere. And again, it's a new IBM. They, you know, the old IBM would say, no, we want to keep this to ourselves. I mean, even recent IBM, no, we just only make that Watson available on IBM cloud. Yeah. Well, totally different mindset under Arvind. No, take that software and put it everywhere. You know, you see, by the way, you see an Oracle do something similar, right? Oracle running on an Azure. So yeah. it used to be, no, we're only going to run an Oracle. So, so this is a mindset shift. Of people realizing, Hey, we got to get Watson X into as many SaaS applications and as many places as possible. All the hyperscalers building relationships, like why not? I mean, that's, that's the way to do it. I think Amazon actually proved this out with the partnership model. You can make money with competitors yeah i think microsoft has got the co-pilot madness going on clearly from there you're seeing them with ai big time they have the, the estate software state to do that and again we've been saying scale wins and if you have a, a, um, a it or software estate install base you can you can leverage that look at informatical world this week okay um this company 
Okay, we went private and then went public. We've been covering them for forever. Amit Wally, and we've covered before. Amit was the CEO. He, was, he ran product before CEO. They've made all the right product moves. They had Claire, the AI stuff, way before AI, as as did a bunch of other companies we've been covering. But they're in the governance um, area too. And that's so hot, hot a product. You know, there's a rumor that Salesforce wanted to buy Informatica. I don't know if you remember that day, but. Oh, yeah. According, Infor- yeah. according to my sources, again, this is um, not yet reported. This is a little scoop here on the cube. Salesforce walked away because the price was too high. So Informatica wanted a richer deal and Salesforce said no. So that means Informatica's were, 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 Informatica is worth a lot more than people think it is. So I'm going to keep an eye on Informatica because they got the keys to the kingdom. If they can manage governance with AI, that is the key ingredient for the scaling on the enterprise side. Data governance in in built in from day one for any kind of application. In other words, before anyone codes a line of code around AI, if govern- governance isn't built into the data modeling, there's no real value. Otherwise, it's, they won't they won't release it because of compliance reasons. So it's a very nuanced point, but data governance is now the new key ingredient before data is released. Think of it like a beacon. You got to have the, before the data flies, you got to track it from day one. <laughs> you need to have that origination point uh, concept. And I think that's going to be a big part of the, the the data wars, okay? We got Databricks coming up. You got Snowflake Summit. You're going to be at Snowflake. I'm going to be at Databricks. We have a bunch of other events. Clicks of, Click is coming up as well. AWS has got a big financial services thing in New York City. But you're seeing right now in the market a, a the beginnings of, the battle between the big data, next generation data providers and the cloud players, because you're starting to see security and data management become very hot topics with generative AI because it's data is involved. So what's yeah. happening is, do you, does, does Snowflake partner with Microsoft? We saw them partner at, at Bill. Oh, yeah. There's a big announcement they, about They are, about, yeah, they're doing that. And it makes sense. Snowflake's very much a big enterprise company. It would make sense for Databricks to partner with, say, AWS, Dave, don't you think? Hey, you know, wouldn't that be of good? Course. You know, well, you're the primitives over here and you got the monolithic Microsoft over here in the enterprise. Snowflake, I think, aligns great with Microsoft um, from well, a customer a, standpoint. A, a year ago. Lock-in um, standpoint. A year ago, Snowflake um, re-upped its commitment and, and long-term commitment to Microsoft. And, and Frank Slootman shared with me that he had a conversation with Satya is like, look, we got to do a better job partnering together. You know, you, you don't be competing with us. Let's partner AWS. You know, he learned that model with AWS. He perfected that uh, Snowflake did. And so it's starting to kick in now a year later with Microsoft. Snowflake announced earnings though. And Snowflake is in a major pivot, right? I mean, they, they good revenue beat. I think a 33% the new, C- percent the new CEOs growth. at the table. Well, yeah, so they had like a 30% plus revenue growth. They missed on EPS and they blamed GPU cost and margin pressure. I think there's a couple of things going on there. One is, yeah, they are in a major pivot. They're pivoting to to become an AI company and we know they were behind in that in that sense. They were, they're tied to AWS, you know, very closely. Um, and so, you know, they're playing catch up. So they they made some they made an acquisition, put a, a couple acquisitions, put <clears throat> put a C, the AI CEO in charge. But there's other sort of under the cover. They're blaming CPU or GPU costs, but there's other cost constraints that Snowflake has. People are doing a lot of the hardcore data engineering work and data pipelining work outside of Snowflake because it's expensive to do inside of Snowflake. And that's what we're hearing consistently from customers. Well, and just- and and so and and remember, Snowflake passes along, they mark up and pass along AWS costs. Okay, so they don't, they, and so they can't lower those too much because they have the cost associated with them. It'll hurt their margins. So they've got a little yeah. gross margin challenge right now, and and it's gonna be interesting to see how they you know turn that around. But they're a company in transition, and we're gonna learn more at Snowflake Summit. Well, it's interesting. We were just talking about uh, you know the the chip guys. You know, you could all say all oh, this is part of the new super cloud spec, uh, but if you look at what they did with Snowflake, Microsoft, Fabric and um, Snowflake partnership. Um, the, with Fabric, Microsoft's product, they introduced One Lake. One Lake was their unified software layer uh, for bi-directional, uh, more efficient data management. 
Okay. Supports Delta Lake, um, iceberg, um, all that stuff. And, and, and snowflakes so, feeding that, right? Yeah. It's bi-directional access. It's a bi-directional data access across fabric and snowflake, ensuring basically data can be analyzed across any engine in fabric or in snowflake depending upon the customer's needs. So this is was that super cloud conversation that we were talking about, Dave, how snow Bingo. just connecting the <laughs> tissue between both areas. And so this, again, brings up what we're working on from a research standpoint, the six data platform, we're code word, where you know, we're starting to look at compute and data being unbundled. And then this is the plumbing that's the beginning of what I call the middleware fight for gener this next generation. As this next cycle comes in, which we just talked about, this disruptive enablement, the disruptive enablement is the data layer. So as the action right now happens at the infrastructure layer, we just went through the chips, all that action, servers, CapEx, GPUs, clustered systems, all that great stuff. Neural networks, AI operating that system is great. The next battleground is going to be the middle layer. Who and what is involved in the data? Who manages it? Do applications drive it? Do the developers drive it? Or is it set up in advance as a programmable data layer, this is the big question. We're gonna we're gonna ask this question. This this next wave of events, Snowflake, Databricks, um, throughout the rest of the the every year, where is the battle? You What's know, at stake? That's the question. You know, one of the concerns I do have um, is that there are similarities. We've talked about this on other cube pods between this AI era and the and you know the dot com boom uh, and bust, in that. Uh, the big hyperscalers accounted for, I think it was 45% of NVIDIA's revenue <laughs> last quarter. And what happens there is they then, you know, they they invest in companies like Anthropic and OpenAI who then turn around and buy GPU, you know, compute from the hyperscalers. So you have this little virtuous cycle. The real value ultimately is going to be up the stack in applications to the point you just sort of alluded to. And we are going to see radical new applications from PCs and mobile all the way through the enterprise, supply chain, healthcare, financial services, manufacturing, industry 4.0, digital twins. I mean, this is, it's going to be mind blowing the applications that developers are going to create um, on top of these new AI platforms. Yeah. But it's going to take time to evolve and it's going to take time. You know, Jensen talks about, wow, you're going to make a lot of money if you buy bigger GPUs. Yeah. If you're Google and you're selling ads, if you're meta and you're selling ads, that's true. But you know what, if you're, a, if you're a bank or you're a manufacturer, you're going to have to develop these new applications and it's going to take a while before you can actually figure out and how to turn that into, you know, game changing revenue that throws off enough cash that you can really invest it back in the business. And so, so I do worry that it's not going to be a smooth line to the future of AI. It's at some point it's going to get disrupted. I think semiconductors have always been cyclical. And at some point, you know, even though we're forecasting great things for NVIDIA, you're going to see some bumps in the road along yeah. the way. And I can't tell you when that's going to happen. I just feel like it, it almost certainly is a high probability that it's going to happen. Well, your point about NVIDIA and the data center number you quoted, 40% was hyperscalers. That's about yeah, eight that. that's like about eight billion dollars, okay. Mid 40s, say eight, eight and almost nine billion from cloud providers. Okay. Some would say it's not including Oracle, but maybe Meta's in there. I think it was it, higher. I think it was closer to 10 or 11, John, but either way, it's a huge number. Yeah. <laughs> it's a huge number. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So just take stay with it. So that's just the cloud players. The the cloud players are a proxy for what's going to be happening in the enterprise with the on-premise action happening with the GPU side with scoped workloads. Okay. If six, if that's mid 40, say if it say it's half the data center revenue, that's still half. That means the pie is still going to grow bigger on the enterprise side. So you still got, we have up the moat, the TAM expansion or TAM, or the market adoption, I should say, not expansion is going to come on the enterprise side. So the hyperscales will continue to buy. That doesn't even include the second tier, not second tier, but the second wave of cloud players, like the core weeds of the world, the specialty clouds. So you got enterprises will be buying more gear. They're refreshing. So everything from clustered systems, the new servers as AI factory comes online, you'll see that happen. And, and then that's just more growth. Again, back to the, yeah. the shock waves. We are in now the cycle. 
We are at the beginning of the wealth creation surge, value creation surge. There's going to be so much money to be made. It's going to be ridiculous. You're going to see massive amounts of people get rich. Companies' value is going to be increasing. And, and it's going to be fun to watch people picking the horses, as you say, Dave, petting on the ponies. Who's going to you, break out? You, um, you talked about IBM and kind of infusing AI into, you know, all its, its legacy, you know, systems, everybody's going to do that. And there's gonna be a lot of on-prem AI, you know, Dell's buying up GPUs, uh, and there's some evidence that it's starting to happen. And so, you know, every, you know, Jensen basically said, and I think he's right. He goes, there's a trillion dollar install base out there and it's going to be uh, accelerated. Now the question for for the Dells and the IBMs and the HPEs and the Cisco's of the world is okay. How much of that is incremental, you know, versus you know they've got to manage the decline of their existing business. So that's not it's not like oh all of a sudden you know we're going to get a trillion dollars. So some of that is going to be you know replacement and much of that is going to be replacement revenue. But the point is it's going to be a hybrid AI world. You know I think that we you know last week we wrote about this pretty extensively and shared some ETR data on that front. Um, and so. It's again, John, it's the gen AI power law. Wait, is gonna the, play this, out. this is like a, the, the new, this whole new cycle, this industry cycle is first of all, it's a, the biggest we probably super cycle. We ever it is seen. a super cycle. It's a super cycle. But here's the thing. Like you mentioned, IBM and Dell and these other companies, what investors, investors got to realize. And if the, if the companies don't realize themselves, the management team, then they're going to, they're going to be dead. What happened before this is irrelevant. It's like it's like when a whole new season starts with with sports. You got a new team, new manager, new players. You can get re a new team on the field. The whole new season starts. The scoreboard zero. Everyone's equal. Now the game is on. So it gives companies like IBM an opportunity to get better. So that's why you know you and I were the way we reported IBM was. I was not surprised, but um, pleasantly shocked in the sense of how farther along they are, positioned for AI. Now they got a lot of work to do. I'm not super super glowing about them too much but they're definitely looking at this game and they are positioned to get some take some territory they're not the old ibm the, they're the new ibm and they're back because they got red hat red hat has got a bunch of techies in there that are driving a lot of innovation and it's all open source so i think ibm is one of those companies where you say in this new super cycle they they got game right they got some game to, they, they can take some territory so so right now if you're hpe and you these companies it's a whole new ball game and if you're not standing in attention right now figuring out what the hell to do you, you and if you don't have that answer it's rhetorical then you're probably gonna you better look for the exits pretty quickly because it won't last it's going to be two three years just to see that the 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 takeover like i said it's a disruptive enablement market which means someone's disrupted it's that it's like that old joke dave if you can't spot the sucker at the poker table, it's probably you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, well, you know, if 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 you don't if you don't if you can't answer the question, what what am I going to do in this new super cycle of this massive uh, new cycle of in, in, innovation? Then you're you're probably gonna you don't know it, but you're gonna probably slowly die. Well, and this is the thing. So so to your point, I I think every CEO, technology CEO, understands this that we are in a super cycle. The hard part is is okay. Where do we add value? So they're obviously going to double down on what they do best, but how sustainable is that value? You know, you wonder, you see these startups, they get a term sheet and then the next thing you know, they turn around and there's, there's, there's somebody else is disrupting them. You know, Snowflake yeah. was, was trying to make an acquisition, you know, that fell through of an AI company. I wonder why, was it price or was it, wow, yeah. something that open AI is about to announce that is going to disrupt that and why spend a billion dollars and so on the one hand, if you wait, you could get killed in the, in the storm. And if you, if you don't wait, you could over rotate and make the wrong bet. And yeah. so it's really difficult right now for, I think for tech CEOs. And so what they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, what do, what are we really, really good at? How can we yeah. apply AI to do things that others, you know, aren't going to be as good at so that we, to Jensen's point can be first. So we're not 0.3% better. So that we're in order of magnitude better. Well, first of all, on the consumer side, you got to be first and you got to get scale. And, and that favors the centralized models. It's It favors closed models on the proprietary model side. That's consumer, I would say, the large side. That's a home run hitting market. You got to swing for the fences on that one. 
if you're not number one or in the top three, you're dead. So I look at that market, the consumer AI market, as a home run hitting market. You got to hit the home runs. It's a hits. It's a home run business. Enterprise, a whole different ball game. Being first might not necessarily be a good thing. You got to be right. You can't be wrong on the enterprise. So you see, it's a, it's about singles and doubles in the enterprise, and getting it right with the data. You can't have hallucinations. So I think a little bit different market there. But you're, you're the 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 point about bets is the right one. So if you're a company or an investor, you're making bets. And the question is, if I'm looking at a supplier, if I'm a company and I got a supplier coming in, if they don't, if they're not doing something new with AI, if they're just the same old story, they're probably BSing you. They don't, they got to have something new and it's got to be either contribute to either cost reductions or revenue generation. Okay. If those things aren't in place, they won't survive on the investor side. You got to show me someone that's in, in the same category, doing something completely disruptively enabling that's different and you have to show it, or it's something net new because generative AI is a new category. You're, you're going to have solutions that are like a new thing. So you have, you have the old joke is, Hey, what pain points do you have? Well, some solutions are going to be solve pain points and some are going to be just net new value. You've never had this before. It creates one of two things, lower cost or higher revenue. So net new capabilities or pre-existing solution with new things happening with AI. So if you're an investor or a buyer, if those things are, are happening, that's a good sign. If it doesn't, it's probably a BS solution. Well, so, or, or, you know, people are going to try to make aspirin as well. And so, but I think to your point, you, you know, you got to be, you got to be first and you got to be right. Well, one, one and, headache, one headache, Dave, is when you look at the, the revenue forecast, say shit, sales are down. Yeah, that's a headache. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it exactly. A, a steroid? Is it a steroid growth, growth hormone, or is it a uh, aspirin? Um, again, growth, growth is, could come from you know, new things. Um, yeah. Again, it's interesting to see Dave about new categories. I think it was someone, I think it was Michael Dell might've said this or Arvin or no, it was Arv, Arvin, the C, uh, Krishna CEO of IBM. He goes, we're sharing the pie in our ecosystem strategy because it's not, we're not worried about our partners competing with us. We're worried about the company that has not yet formed. And he's got a good point. It's in these markets, when you have these super cycles that come every 20 years in the industry, new brands emerge. There's going to be a startup that's going to rise to the top. The question is, what? where does that come from? And, and or does that not get enabled because of the hyperscalers? Like right now, some are saying that the hyperscalers are controlling most of the AI startups by their, by their spend. Is that true? I don't know, but that's what's being well, talked about. But, but to your point about um, the ecosystem and partners, again, I think, I think Amazon or AWS perfected that model. I mean, they got a very, very strong ecosystem and they're proving that that's the right way to get another flywheel and make money. And I think everybody's yeah. in the industry is realizing that I was sat through the Dell. I don't know how I got here, but I got invited to the Dell partner event inside of uh, Dell tech world. You remember when we were at Cisco, the big comfy chairs that we were yeah. sitting in, how nice that was, but there were only like, what, I don't know, 80, a hundred analysts. There must've been a thousand people in this room, big comfy chairs and a huge, huge room. And it was like, you know, the partner pump up, Michael came in and spoke and he had Billy Scannell came in, you know, he heads, heads go to market at Dell and, um, and the, only half of Dell's business goes through the channel. And this, so there's a ton of upside. And they were like, the channel was pumped up. Yeah. Dell was pumped up. Everybody wants to to tap into this AI wave. And if you're a channel partner and you don't have all the resources, you want to belly up to a company like, like a Dell, you know, or a Cisco or an HPE or an Amazon hyperscale, et cetera. And you want to tap their knowledge and then create your own, you know, little I, uh, moat in the world. And so it's all about how you integrate that, those capabilities yeah. and you got to pick the right spots. You got to pick the right partners. And, yeah. um, a lot to lot to choose from these days with all this open source, with all yeah. this innovation that's coming out. So uh, yeah, I, I, I saw Billy Scandal and Jeff Clark. I had some time to spend at a beer with those guys uh, at uh, Tuesday night and had a great chat about the channel and what they're going to win. They were all smiling. The AI factory is a winning hand from uh, Dell. Um, it's hyped up. It's relevant. It's, it speaks to this super cycle. Um, 
Dell did a great job on, on jumping on that bandwagon. But speak, speaking of open source, Dave, one, one company we haven't talked about, and I've said this on the Cube podcast before, Meta is the dark horse. Yeah. Okay. Meta is essentially the open source version of trying to compete against the closed systems. So if you look at like OpenAI and Anthropic, the proprietary models, that's the big argument right now in, in the in this in the industry is which one's better? A uh, a distributed open with no moat where developers can come in and drive it, or do you want the centralized version that has scale? That's the NVIDIAs of the world. That's open AI where they get the value capture and create a moat. So you have two competing philosophies happening right now. That's why I brought up the Databricks snowflake war. I call it the data cloud wars because you got to align with um, an approach here because they're they're not necessarily bad. You've got to pick one. You can't do both. You can't say I'm going to be value capture um, centralized and then be open. You can't do both. You can't be stuck in the middle between those two strategies. You got to ultimately pick and commit to one side. I think Databricks is going to go obviously go open source. Meta is open source. Meta wins because they are going to play the Microsoft playbook in the early days, which is win the developers. Remember Microsoft's success was own the operating system and the applications and own the developers. Remember Balmer's famous um, video, developers, 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 developers right? They, 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 they own de developers and you know, everyone else was a competitive threat and they had their little kingdom. They, they kept the developers completely happy. They made them a lot of money. Uh, the more Windows grew, the more the developers made, the more they were happier. So I think I think Facebook is smart to get Llama out there because they got Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, they got all this data. Copilots is the new and the agents of the new applications. If Microsoft, I mean, if, if Meta can get that going, that's a better business model for them. So it's the same NVIDIA model with having a moat strategy behind open source. Look at Red Hat. Red Hat made a lot of money on Linux, but they Sent OS ended up becoming commercialized. Meta's doing the same exact playbook with Llama. You know, are they are they charity? Are they are they philanthropy business? No, no, they're they're capitalists. So they're good. well, you know, they're good. Go ahead, yeah, play that out. So I had I, I had a conversation with somebody at Dell Tech World. I forget who it was, and they were saying, well, you know, if you're behind, you open you do open source, and I'm like, yeah, that's true. And, and then they said, yeah, Meta's behind. That's why they're open sourcing. I said, well, we made it maybe, but but I don't think that's the the angle. I said, you remember OCP? I said, what yeah. Meta did is they said, we're going to commoditize hardware. We're going to publish the standard. And as a result, our costs, which are huge, are going to go down. And we could take 10% out of our hardware costs. That drops right to the bottom line. And I think that's what they're doing with, with Llama. They're basically saying, yeah. here, let's use, the, let's use the open source community so that we can remain competitive on, on innovation. Let's commoditize as best yeah. we can LLMs and then we're going to build on top of it. We're going to build value on top of that. Yeah, we'll and, and and better than that, they will be a provider of all the GPU horsepower they're building out. So the CapEx yes. game kicks so, in. So they're going to get the scale the other side. So there's two ways to win on scale. Meta takes the open approach, seed the base with open source, get everyone wanting on your picks and shovels. The GPU business is theirs. They're bogarting all the GPUs from NVIDIA. They're one of the big buyers. You know, Broadcom's so, on the Octane's on the board of Facebook. So, so again, Facebook's Meta, got, yeah. Meta's so, got a lot of dough, and they're going to spend, 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 get the scale, and then so, go bottoms up from the developers. So when I said and they get it for free, top down, right? When I said they get it for free, obviously they spent a lot of money on capex, but they got the money to spend. It's sitting on the balance sheet, so they can they can spend the money. It doesn't, you know. It, what else are they going to do with their money? And then what they get for free is the de developer ecosystem builds on top of it, yeah. helps them innovate. And then what Meta can do is take advantage of those innovations and monetize it, you know, till the cows come home, you know, with ads. Well, the question the question to ask is, this is what we'll explore in the next couple of months. Is model quality the same with open and closed? I would argue that open AI is increasing their quality much faster than Llama is. Okay. What software package do you use that's open versus the closed one? I agree with you, John. I I I use iOS or Android. But I use a I use a lot of them. I use you know Google tools. I will use Perplexity. I use OpenAI. I use Meta AI. I still find OpenAI. I mean, it varies. Sometimes you get better answers from some of the others. 
but I still find the closed models <laughs> a little bit better. Hey, you can, if you really want an open source, you can get Open Office. There's a product out there called Open Office. First of all, I wouldn't even uh, Google Google Docs is better in my opinion, but Office is better than Open Office because Microsoft puts money into it. So again, there's an argument to be had that Open is good, but if there's no real opportunity for someone to make it great. By itself, generically, Llama 3 will never, ever be as good, in my opinion, as the closed models on its own unless Meta drives it harder. But still, they're seeding the base. That's commoditizing it for other values. That's going to sequence on their side of the balance. Well, that says meaning, then... Meaning they're going to end up capturing the value. So they're essentially head-faking the market by feeding the developers to win them over. Well, that says then that the, the, the models won't become a commodity, which is what you've predicted, as long as the innovation's there. Um, and I mean, so I, I think, I think the open source is the way to go personally, because the long tail has proven to be valuable as we pointed out and the developers have an opportunity to be entrepreneurial. And I think what you, what you worry about these big systems like NVIDIA is that the entrepreneurial growth of new startups to come in and create value are, are limited when you have large players squeezing the market access and market, uh, market opportunity. So good platforms like Amazon and others should create opportunities for developers and entrepreneurs to start companies where's the next airbnb where's the next um meta where's the next dropbox or box um it's got to come from somewhere so so in this next generation you'll see new companies and they got to be enabled by something so the question is what is the disruptive enablement for startups besides capital <laughs> it's, that's not disruptive that's just that's cash um and that's and i think i think the gen ai open source is a disruptive enabler Yes, and but if that's how it's applied to create a completely new way of doing things. Everybody right now looking for okay, how does it disrupt the advertising business? And you know, I, I honestly haven't figured that out, or I guess I wouldn't be doing breaking analysis every Friday. I, I asked that. I asked the CEO of IBM direct question. I said, Arvin, will there be an operating system for AI like Linux was for the computing generation? He smiled. Because he was a trick question, because I know um, Red Hat's an OS with Linux. <laughs> and, and I've been saying that IBM's going to try to be the OS for AI. And I said, you know, neural networks and knowledge graphs, all these things are now in play. But is, is there an opportunity to create a whole nother operating system concept to run AI at scale across large scale environments like the Internet and the enterprises? And he he smiled. And said, well, not really. I wouldn't use the word operating system, he said, because you know that would create tons of chaos and drama. He said, I do see distributed computing paradigm kicking in where the work, he used the word AI workflows, which I thought was a great choice of words. It was, it was the most conservative way to say, yes, it's going to be an operating system. Um, so well, what does an operating system do? I mean, there's a strict <laughs> definition of what an OS is on a computing system, but essentially connects and links and loads and runs stuff. It runs things, runs programs. Right. So it so orchestrates so, it. Yeah. Right. And so one of the big things that came out of IBM was this thing called Instruct Lab, which came from Red Hat. Engineers were sleeping in their office for months to get this new product. It actually creates an interface between LLMs to integrate in runtime, meaning they talk to each other, which is something that we've been saying will happen on the cube. An operating system actually connects and coordinates things. It's got schedules, it's got loaders, it links things, it compiles, it connects systems, run programs. So generative AI is, is now in a mode where it generates things for the first time from data. And that's the magic of it. It's not programmed. Like Jensen said, he said this, uh, Jensen Wong at NVIDIA said this on stage. This is a new category because it's not programmed in advance. It's not like a pre um, set up function. Generative creates a new thing. So in that it's runtime. So this is a concept of computer science concepts, well known called operating environments and running programs. So I think you get to look at the, the internet as a distributed computing paradigm running a collection of programs. When and I got say, to, um, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, then that's got to get run. But no, if it's a neural network, get a whole nother fabric to run on and all these different systems, clustered systems, it's an opportunity to connect the hardware with a middle layer and an application layer, almost on the classic three leg layer concept. And, and that could be cut in, into multiple slices. It's like stacking a bunch of pancakes. You can do whatever you want with it. And that's that's the magic of Gen AI. So I think I think there'll be an AI that'll come out of the marketplace. 
uh, the next 10 years, a whole nother thing that no one's ever seen before that'll connect robots and data and machines together and, and these fabrics. And yeah, no system. doubt. Just what it, don't know what that is. When, when I landed on the red eye at IBM think and, and, uh, I ran it to Stu and I was like, Stu, talk, give me your take on instruct lab. I'm hearing a lot of buzz about it. And basically what he described it as is you can, you can, when you train, you know, you obviously do a lot of work and training. It takes, it takes, you know, a lot of resource, but then when you have to, then you have to tune the model and the way you tune the model is oftentimes you just get a bazillion humans involved. He said, what you could do with instruct lab is you can do some minimal training but then the AI takes over and generates, you know, it's kind of its own training, you know, and then you, you know, you can, you can knuckle it down and then you can, you can, you know, bring it to market. So that was kind of interesting and a lot of optionality inside of instruct lab, obviously IBM starting with, you know, it's got granite in there, but it's got other models that it's going to bring in over time. So I thought that was interesting in terms of, you know, when you think about how do you build, I mean, the big gestalt conversation is how do you build a moat? around open source your point right. being you can't sit on the fence you got to be i guess all in on open source and if you're going to be all in then you got to figure out all right well how do i build unique competitive advantage yeah. and obviously red hat has perfected that and it's, now it's, ibm it's, owns it it's the classic commercialization of open source you just give it away for free and then you end up becoming the steward of it but in struct lab though the what came out of that just as nuanced points before we, while we wrap up the pod today yeah. is that it was developed by senior kernel level developers at red hat in boston they they they, they saw it out of ibm labs they grabbed it and they literally slept in the office for months just cutting their teeth into this they were so excited and this isn't this wasn't like a hackathon like hey let's get some you know beer and have a little selfie and do a hackathon we're talking about kernel level developers hardcore cs guys and this points to the why i love this market because there's real technical problems to solve. And that's going to attract real smart people um, to work on these killer problems. And what's going to happen is you'll see some lucky strikes. You'll see some lightning in a bottle. You'll see ventures come out of the woodwork, I think, that'll surprise people. Like the Instruct Lab is one example. It reminded me of uh, the early days when people would sleep in their office when Netscape was launching the browser, right? It's like, hey, you know, this is so compelling and motivating that people will literally sleep in the office. You they're, um, so, they're so excited to work on this. You spent... And, oh, good. Sorry. Yeah, people's sorry. careers are going to be jacked up big time because it's fun <laughs> if you're into it. Mm -hmm. If you like to solve problems and build new things, this market is, again, this super cycle will create new wealth, new ventures, new 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 opportunity new value and again the developer frenzy they're intoxicated right now on ai it's beautiful i know we got to go but but i you th made me think of something the the instruct lab thing with came out of ibm you know research you spent a lot of time with dario gill mm -hmm. at, uh, at ibm you yep. were telling me and i asked him in um over last november at the ibm thomas watson research center like what's really different, him and Rob Thomas, what's really different about, you know, IBM in the context of taking innovations out of research and actually productizing them? Is it really different this time around? And they gave me a number of, of, of examples of not just things that they've done, but why the process is different. So what you just described is interesting to me, but because it was like almost like IBM research threw it over the fence and said, hey, we got this. But the culture maybe is different where the, the, the team at IBM, the go to market team, the product team feels like, Hey, this is a, 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 a ingredients that we can now take and do with what we like. We have a lot more latitude to do that. Maybe that's part of the, the cultural change. I, I don't know what you just described sound very much like, you know, uh, like unplanned organic innovation versus, okay, IBM research was working directly with Red Hat to create this innovation. No, it was more like, hey, company, here it is. Who wants it? And people like grabbed on and, and innovated. Yeah. I mean, I think IBM and HP, the old HP, now HPE, they all have these old school research, classic research, like Palo Alto Research Park, you know, the famous where Steve Jobs stole the operating system. They Xerox work on Park. The, yeah. Xerox Park. They work on high end stuff. Bell so, Labs. Yeah. But they don't, they're not incentive to commercialize, they're incentive to research and create breakthroughs. 
when you have a company like Red Hat, which has systems thinkers, Red Hat has a nerd culture, Dave. We love, we've been covering Red Hat forever. We know everyone over there. You got the combination of the old Red Hat nerds, software open source, combined with the old digital equipment corporation dudes like Steve, like Paul Comey years of the world and Matt, Matt, <laughs> Matt uh, over there. Matt Hicks. Ooh, Matt Hicks. These guys are smart. They're systems guys. When they see magic, they're not dumbasses. They go, whoa, what is this in the lab? So they can see the commercializations because they're so in the open. They're used to doing collaborative projects. So when they see good things, they can see a diamond in the rough. And then in this case, what happened with Instruct Labs, what Dario told me and Rob Thomas is, and, and Matt Hicks, the guys got exposed to it because they, they're now in IBM. They get to kind of like see what's in the closet. They open up the the, 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 the treasure trove of IP. They're like, what is this? And they go, we got to open source. This is a two. This is really, this is really uh, awesome. And they started working on it. And their vision was to create kind of this kernel of connective tissue for models. Okay. And that's the, that's the way I see it. And then Matt's like brought Irvin in. So you, you got to see this. This is incredible. And then Irvin's like, we got to open source that. And IBM constantly made the decision to open source it. Rather than squirrel it away in their own little world, the old IBM would have done that under Ginny, Ginny Remini. would have said, no, no, we're going to make this a software package. We're going to sell it. No, no, open source it all the way. So Red Hat totally drove this. And it's not that Red Hat's better than IBM. It's just the culture of Red Hat is like, they can see that and connect the dots between something that's got potential and a path. And then that's what gets people together. It's like good musicians on stage and music. You get, you know, a good, good band going on and you got harmony. Some of the best projects I talk to folks all over the, the this generation, it's like three to four people are making magic happen. So the, these developers, not is maybe a one or two pizza team models are back. So it's never left, but that seems to be the, the big deal there. So again, IBM doing innovative things, mainly because of Red Hat there. Yeah. I'm just, right. I just, I just made the mistake of opening my email. Everybody's dumping last minute to do's on the, on the long weekend. <laughs> Dave, it's been, hey, we gotta we're, go. we're over time. Have a great weekend. And, Thanks, John. Uh, we'll you too. Thanks you. team for hanging late have, here. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Go to siliconangle.com for all the news. And again, the shockwaves are hitting. The AI shockwaves are hitting. See you next time.